is Mr. Stan Laurel. And this is Mr. Oliver Hardy. They are without doubt the most recognisable comedy double act the world has ready? ever seen. Goodbye, Ollie. Goodbye, Stanley. One. Two. Ollie. What? I just thought of something. To witness the humble beginnings of these kings of comedy, we have to journey back through time to 1890. On June the 16th of that very year, Stan Laurel was born. He was christened Arthur Stanley Jefferson and his birthplace was a quaint little village called Ulverston in the county of Lancashire, England. If you visit there today, you'll find the world famous Laurel and Hardy Museum packed to overflowing with a veritable cornucopia of memorabilia photographs and movie posters, all dedicated to these two gentle comic geniuses. Stan was born not too far away from his dedicated museum at number 3 Argyle Street. It was his maternal grandmother's house whom, according to his father's published memoirs, was a dear little old lady of fragrant memory. In truth, she was something of a dragon, a strict Methodist who'd punish young Stan for any tiny misdemeanor. Stan lived in his grandmother's home until he was five years old and was, by all accounts, quite an introverted child. This shyness was at complete odds to his theatrical father, A.J. Jefferson, who was a self-made impresario and talented stage actor. AJ had run a very successful acting troupe called the Jefferson Theatre Group, where he'd met and married Madge Metcalf, Stan's mother, and he was now manager of the illustrious Metropole Theatre in Glasgow, Scotland. Because Stan was never particularly interested in studying at school, in fact many years later, in correspondence with friends, he stated that he was the worst scholar to attend school. His father encouraged him to spend time helping out at the theatre. Stan's love of the stage grew from here as he witnessed the first of many of his father's self-penned comedy review shows. Sadly, just as Stan was beginning to fashion himself as something of a stage comedian, his mother Madge, who'd always suffered fragile health, passed away in 1908. It was an event that would push Stan on to pursue fame and fortune across the Atlantic Ocean in the land of opportunities. He was soon to be heading for the bright lights of America. Whilst all this was happening, the other half of the comedy duo-to-be was already doing his own thing in America. Oliver Hardy was born on January the 18th, 1892, in the festive town of Harlem, in the state of Georgia. He was the son of a grand lawyer, Oliver Hardy, and his wife, Emily Norvell. Their bouncing baby boy was christened Norvell Hardy, in order to carry on both sides of the family heritage. Ollie would later add the Oliver to his name in memory of his father, who died a mere 18 months into his son's life. The parallels between Stan and Ollie at this time are very striking. Like Stan, Ollie lost a parent at an early age, and this would spur him on to leave his mark on the world too. Also, like Stan, Ollie was uprooted from his family home as his mother moved the widowed family to the town of Milledgeville, where she managed the Baldwin Hotel. He was sent to a boarding school of sorts, the Georgia Military College, and rebelled against the stern nature of the teaching by becoming the class clown. 
in the same way as Stan would watch fascinated from the backstage of the Metropole Theatre, Ollie would sit in the lobby of the Baldwin Hotel and people watch to see what mannerisms and personalities he could mimic. Both of them were soaking up influences like a giant comedy sponge to be squeezed out later in life onto the silver screen. In 1910, Stan joined the Fred Carno Comedians on a tour of America. Fred Carno was the archetypal self-made showman, building an empire around him by channeling other people's talents into his spectacular shows. He also typified the perfect example of the thin line between comedy and tragedy, as all great comedy has a foothold in real tragedy. Whereas on stage, he brought delight to thousands with his pantomimes and popular farces. Off stage, he was a wife beater and a serial adulterer. Carno's biggest discovery was a young man called Charlie Chaplin. It was this comic genius that Stan was to understudy and learn from during this initial tour of America. The Fred Carno troupe set sail from Southampton docks and toured the USA with a show called A Night in an English Music Hall. It was a huge success, but even though he was earning plaudits for his comedy turns, Stan decided to return to England alone. His main motivation seemed to be twofold. Firstly, he felt he deserved a chance at being the top billing, and secondly, he felt he deserved more money. Ollie was still happily settled in America, and in the year Stan was touring his mother country, Ollie set up and ran a movie theatre in the heart of Milledgeville. At 18 years of age, he was the youngest manager of a cinema in the whole of the United States. It was watching these flickering comedy two-reelers that sowed the seeds of stardom in Ollie's head. And so it was in 1913 that Ollie set off for the bright sunshine of Florida to try to break into the movie business. He took with him his Jewish wife whom he'd met and married in a whirlwind romance. Her name was Madeline Soloshin and she was an accomplished piano player, allowing Ollie to indulge in his favourite pastime of singing. Shine on, shine on, harvest moon Up in the sky I ain't had no loving since January, April, June or July no time, take no time to stay outdoors and spoon. Shine on, shine on, harvest moon for me and my gal. Stan was scratching out a living in England with a few misguided comedy acts. In the end, such was the extent of his poverty, he rejoined the Fred Carno comedians for another tour of America. Again, Charlie Chaplin was the acknowledged star of the show and gained all the praise from audiences and newspaper reviews. Perhaps Stan looked on at Chaplin with that wide-eyed expression of his massaged his mop of hair, wondering when it would be his turn to take the curtain calls. 1913 was the year that Madeline Soloshin became Mrs Oliver Hardy, 
and Ollie himself joined the Lubin Motion Pictures Company in Jacksonville, Florida. It's also the year that Charlie Chaplin was lured away from Fred Carnot by another self-made showman called Max Sennett. Chaplin immediately took up his offer and joined the Keystone Studios that were the acknowledged capital of comedy filmmaking at this time. It's here that his stage act evolved into the Little Tramp persona, which the whole world knows and loves. Of course, Chaplin's hasty exit meant that the Fred Carno tour quickly folded and Stan was once more forced to scrape a living by setting up a comedy act of his own. This time he stayed in America, perhaps because his homeland was on the verge of entering into the long and bloody First World War and young men of his age were being enlisted into the army at great speed. The bright lights of mortar shells and the rat-a-tat-tat of machine gun fire were no match for the bright lights of the stage and the rat-a-tat-tat of applause. In 1917, when all the world seemed to be trying to imitate Chaplin, Ollie paired up with a thin comedian called Larry Sermon. Stan had set up a comedy double act with an amply sized female comedienne called May Dahlberg. In a case of life imitating art, not only was he tripping over himself to fall in love with her on stage, he was also doing exactly the same thing off stage. Their only other stumbling block was that May was already married. However, this didn't stop Stan from changing both their surnames to Laurel so that they could live as a common-law couple. As we go through Stan's life, we'll see a pattern emerge as to his marriages repeating itself wife to wife in much the same way as he'd repeat his comedy situations by putting new slants on them. Stan's tentative steps into the movie business were less successful than his future partners. During his on and off stint in early comedy films, Stan could never find a character. He was always different. Whereas Ollie's character grew out of a long line of similar roles, in the style of that other legendary fat man, Roscoe Arbuckle, Stan's direction to the clown we all know and love was a lot more haphazard. His first foray into films was called Nuts in May, where he played a schizophrenic who thinks he's Napoleon. But Stan was not only hampered by his inability to settle on a stock character, preferring to reinvent himself for every role, but also by his common-law wife. May Laurel insisted, usually by contractual obligation, that she appeared as the love interest in every early film that Stan made. She was not an archetypal femme fatale, and this made it very difficult for Stan to progress any further in the movie business. It was only after her departure that Stan would start being noticed. In 1920, after a barrage of insults were flung at each other like poisoned custard pies, Oliver Hardy was granted a divorce from his wife, Madeline. He'd fallen in love with a fellow employee, a young girl called Myrtle Reeves. They were married the following year, on the 24th of November, Thanksgiving Day. A few years later, Stan followed suit. He said goodbye to his common-law wife, May Laurel, and in 1926, he married Lois Nielsen. Like all good comedies, his first unofficial wife would return later to lay down some more marital banana skins for Stan to slip on. But for now, she vanished into the night with her memories, 
and a hefty bankroll. By this time, Stan and Ollie had been headhunted by the Howl Roach Studios and were working there as separate entities. Stan was primarily a writer and director, whilst Ollie was a supporting player. Yet it wasn't Hal Roach who teamed them up initially. This fell to a man named Leo McCary, a two-time Oscar-winning director who started his career at the Hal Roach Studios. In doing so, he created a comedy double act that would continue to delight and entertain audiences to this day. By the time they started appearing in partnership, Stan Laurel was 37 and Oliver Hardy was 35. It was perhaps the lateness of this success that kept their feet on the ground and their egos in check. Leo McCary proved to be a great influence on the Laurel and Hardy combination, for it was he who managed to slow down their comedy. Early comedies all took their cues from the ever-popular Max Sennett films, where everything was played at a hectic pace, jerky, speeded-up chase sequences, over-the-top gestures and exaggerated comic costumes were the order of the day. put them all to one side to create a more gentle and ultimately realistic pace. The end results were still as ludicrous or calamitous as before, but the build-up was slower and more measured. In their first official film as a team, Duck Soup, Stan and Ollie reused an old sketch written by Stan's father, A.J. Jefferson, dating back to 1905. It only goes to show that comedy, like a fine wine, continues to improve with age. Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy became a true comic partnership in 1927 and were an instant hit with the movie-going public. To end the year on an even higher note, Stan's wife gave birth to a daughter who was christened Lois, like her mother. This happy event took place on December the 10th. In creating the look of Laurel and Hardy, Howell Roach Studios opted for something instantly recognisable, but something with which the audience could empathise. Therefore, the tailored suits and derby hats became their trademark. At the beginning of the century, for a long while afterwards, it was common for market traders and street vendors to wear this kind of upmarket clothing in order to try and appear respectable. The music halls of the United Kingdom and the vaudeville theatres of the United States spotted this habit and used it in their repertoire. It wasn't Chaplin, as many wrongly assume, who started the trend by appearing in this garb on the film. He was simply following on in a rich tradition that had stemmed from a theatrical background in much the same way as Stan Laurel did. In order for the audience to identify with their characters, Stan and Ollie never played anything other than ordinary people in ordinary professions, making ordinary decisions. It's the way they portrayed it that created something extraordinary. At a time of great depression in the economic climate, to play the underdog was to have the majority of the audience automatically on your side. 
This was something both Chaplin and Stan Laurel understood, being as both of them came from a rigidly reworked feudal system in England that branded them as working class. The advent of sound in motion pictures caused a huge shift in popularity for many stars of the day. Chaplin himself, the Grand Master, never truly adjusted and his star began to fade and diminish as he steadfastly refused to embrace the new medium. Luckily, Stan and Ollie's voices matched their physical appearance to perfection. The prisoners have been found guilty. Their attitude towards each other translated into some classic dialogue that rivaled any of their physical antics. There's a nice pickle we're in. At the height of their popularity, Stan and Ollie were churning out film after film, a new release nearly every other month, but at what cost? The high point in their professional lives coincided with many complications and a great deal of unhappiness in both of their home lives. In 1930, Lois Laurel gave birth prematurely to a son, Stanley Robert Jefferson, who only lived for a mere nine days. Stan found solace in the arms of a long-term mistress called Alice Ardell. Ollie, on the other hand, had to deal with Myrtle Hardy's long and painful fight with the bottle. Her alcoholic addiction got so bad that in 1931 she was admitted to the Rosemead Lodge Sanatorium under the pretense of a nervous breakdown. Ollie found solace playing golf and gambling, but he also, like Stan, ended up in the arms of his own long-term mistress, Viola Morse. It's a popular notion that behind the painted face of the clown there lie tears of sadness. This does seem to be the case with most comedians. Their ability to make thousands of people happy never works when trying to make their own lives contented. I'm sorry if I hurt your feelings, Ollie. I didn't mean to be so dispolite. Neither of them had really realised how popular they'd become as a worldwide phenomenon, and it opened their eyes to their own potential. Again, happiness was tempered by sadness as Stan Laurel divorced his wife Lois in 1935. He'd already met and married Virginia Ruth Rogers in an unlawful ceremony, showing that Stan, like his movie persona, was oblivious to rules, regulations and the structure of everyday society. He married her again a little later, but continued his long-term affair with Alice Ardell, so, in retaliation, Virginia Ruth Laurel sued Stan for divorce. Then, whilst he was being sued for divorce, May Laurel, back from the wilderness and obviously running out of money, reappeared to sue Stan for property rights. She stated that a common law wife, although not legally married, was entitled to just as much as any other ex-wife. To make matters worse, Ollie was being sued by Myrtle Hardy for divorce and had to counter sue by showing the truth of the matter, namely that his wife was a serious alcoholic. Stan's court affairs were eventually settled in 1936 and he was granted a divorce. Ollie was granted a divorce the following year. But it wasn't to end there. A single Stan was not a happy Stan, and he immediately fell for the dubious charms of a notorious Hollywood gold digger called Vera Ivanov Shuvalova, better known as Ileana, who claimed to be a Russian countess but could never actually prove whether she was. In haste, Stan tried to marry his Russian bride before he was legally divorced from Virginia Ruth and, in an example of his love life repeating itself, had to remarry Miss Shuvalova after the divorce had been granted. He then decided to marry her once more in a traditional Russian ceremony in case his new bride hadn't understood what was going on in the first two times. 
It's hardly surprising that after the bells stopped ringing for this marriage, Stan and Ileana stepped into the marital ring for one short round of fighting and arguing before divorcing in 1939. What is surprising, in hindsight, is that two genuine classic Laurel and Hardy films emerged from this period of strife. Sons of the Desert came first, showing the pair both married to dominant, overpowering mother figures rather than loving, caring wives. This was released just around the time that both of the boys' marriages were floundering. Way Out West was the second, with our heroes appearing wifeless and living a life on the open road. And it could well have been something they both would have wished for in this time of extreme marital disharmony. It's interesting to note that Stan and Ollie are almost prepubescent in their attitude towards their on-screen wives, a total role reversal of their appetites off-screen. They're also never portrayed as being happily married and are forever trying to keep secrets from and avoid being around their on-screen spouses. Perhaps this stems from Stan's writing drawing influences from his and Ollie's past Stan had known nothing but domineering female figures from an early age, being punished by his strict grandmother for any innocent trouble he got into. Ollie had a mother from the Deep South who not only had to raise five children without a husband, but also managed a thriving hotel business. She once horse-whipped a tattooist for putting a maple leaf on Ollie's forearm when he was 14 years old. It's therefore hardly surprising that their choice of on-screen wives were always ready to do battle with these comic innocents. In The Flying Juices, the first picture they made on loan from Hal Roach in 1939, Stan, who rewrote the script, includes a very pointed reference to his marriage troubles at the time and also plays on Ollie's real-life fondness for betting on horses. One, two... Ollie. What? I just thought of something. Listen, you remember once you were telling me that when we passed away, we'd come back on this earth in some other form, like a bird or a dog or a horse or something? Oh, you mean reincarnation? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Well, now that we're going to go, what would you like to be when you come back? I don't know. I've never given it much thought. I like horses. I guess I'd like to come back as a horse. Huh. What would you like to be when you come back? Oh, I'd rather come back as myself. I always got along swell with me. I you mean... can't come back as yourself. Now, come on and stop wasting my time. Are you ready? Goodbye, Ollie. Goodbye. Stan had left the Hal Roach Studios by the end of 1939. But Ollie's contract was to run until 1940. Stan wanted to renegotiate a joint contract to offer them more freedom in their career, but more security in a financial sense. Unfortunately, because of Stan's many marital mishaps, he was badly in need of money and was happy to re-sign on a short separate contract again in 1940. Their last four films for the Hal Roach Studios were up there with the best of them. The 13-year career they'd established with Hal Roach came to a happy end in 1940 with Saps at Sea, a film in which they seemed full of renewed energy and enthusiasm. Their private lives too seemed to be more settled. Ollie had met and married Lucille Jones, the continuity girl from the Flying Deuces film, though his about turn in affections from Viola Morse showed that he, like his movie persona, found it easy to fall deeply in and out of love on a whim. 
Stan, equally as whimsical, remarried his second wife Virginia Ruth, and they set up Laurel and Hardy Feature Productions. However, it was short-lived. By 1941, Laurel and Hardy Feature Productions was shut down. The huge amount of money that was needed to set up a film for hiring studio space, technicians, sound equipment, the means of distribution and the endless publicity to promote it was never forthcoming. So Stan and Ollie reluctantly agreed to sign on with 20th Century Fox. Ollie was more eager than Stan to do this as he was being chased by the IRS for back taxes, as well as being sued twice for non-payment of alimony by his alcoholic ex-wife Myrtle. By now, the Eternal Clowns were beginning to show their age. As soon as they signed on for 20th Century Fox, their normal white-faced makeup was replaced by a natural flesh tone that exposed every wrinkle and line. Clowns tend to rely on the flexibility and agility of youth to pull off their most complicated of routines. Sadly, by the time they'd gone through the motions in four films for their new employers, Stan Laurel was pushing 55 and Oliver Hardy was hard on his heels at a not-so-sprightly 53. Strict attention, all of you! The men who would have been shot this morning have escaped. Be sure all gates are closed and make a thorough search of the entire barracks. Whoever brings them back will be given a reward of six weeks' furlough. Go! Oh. It seemed to Stan and Ollie that this was a good time to bring the curtain down and take their final bows. They'd never been happy making the longer films as both felt it stretched their comedy and their characters too thinly, resulting in a watered-down version of Laurel and Hardy. Get to work! What do you think this is? Within a year of taking enforced retirement, Stan had divorced Virginia Ruth Laurel again and married Ida Kiteva. His love life would have made the most complex film plot of all and was ripe for a Laurel and Hardy makeover. But at last, he'd found someone to grow old with, a wife who would care for and cherish him just as he'd always wanted. In 1947, British impresario Bernard Delfont, a sort of English version of Hal Roach, invited the boys over to tour the music halls of Great Britain with a review show. Recalling the applause and the adulation from their last tour overseas, they both jumped at the chance to entertain the crowds again, especially ones who'd just spent six long years attempting to survive the grim realities of a Second World War. It also meant that Stan could pay his respects to the father that had encouraged his son to tread the boards of his theatre all those years ago. A.J. Jefferson was 85 years old and extremely proud that his son was returning to the musical circuit that he himself had been so widely known for. Stan and Ollie received a standing ovation at a Royal Command performance, which was a show performed in London before the Royal Family, and then took the show to France, Belgium and Scandinavia, and it was equally as well received as in Stan Laurel's native land. When they returned to the United States of America, Stan found out that he was suffering from diabetes and was put on a special diet. Their return was tinged with more sadness when Ollie's mother, Emily Hardy, passed away at the grand old age of 88. Not long after, Stan's father, AJ, passed away too. A year later than Ollie's mother, but a year behind her in age. Stan and Ollie became, effectively, overgrown orphans. Both of them had lost one of their parents at an early age 
now they were united in grief for the passing of their surviving parent. Resigned to living out the rest of their lives with fading memories of their illustrious movie careers, Stan and Ollie were surprised to receive an offer of a French-Italian co-financed film that would shoot for a couple of months on the French Riviera. It was an offer they really couldn't refuse, but they'd soon regret accepting it. Upon arriving, they found there was no working script, and Stan had to quickly cobble something together with two American writers. To make matters worse, there was no common language, so communication was near impossible for everyone working on the film. And to top it all off, Stan suffered severe problems with his prostate, had an emergency operation, and his diabetes worsened considerably because of the trauma. Now he can smoke it. Maybe he doesn't smoke a pipe. Well, whatever he smokes it. Well, you've got to be careful about those things. to have a permanent medical team on set with him at all times. Ollie's weight had ballooned to a massive 20 stone, whereas Stan's had shrunk to a skeletal 8 stone. But again, the offers flooded in, and they accepted another tour of Great Britain's music halls in 1952. It was such a success that a second tour took place in 1953, in which they began their dates in Ireland, as Ollie's working visa only permitted him to enter Great Britain via the Emerald Isle. They docked in a tiny fishing village and thousands of people flocked to see them embark. Then all of the church bells started ringing out their theme tune, the Cuckoo Song. Stan and Ollie freely admitted that they both had tears streaming down their faces. The public at large still loved these two aged clowns, and it was an affection that would never die. But mortality has a way of pricking the conscience of legend. Ollie had a mild heart attack during this second tour and was ordered to return home and lose weight. His weight had been a constant worry to him all through his life. In later letters to John McBabe, official biographer of Laurel and Hardy, Lucille Hardy would relate her husband's self-loathing for his ample girth and his surprise that his wife would be able to love such a person. Around the time that Stan and Ollie returned to America, there was an increasing popularity building for them in the younger generation, as their earlier films were shown again and again on the relatively new medium of television. Small children in particular loved them. Hal Roach, the original employer of these two comedians had seen firsthand the impact of his creations on the general public. He thought their appeal lay in their characters, which were simple, childlike and innocent. It's said that the best visual comedians imitate children, and nobody could do this as well as Laurel and Hardy and yet still be believable. In late 1954, Stan and Ollie were taken by surprise on the perennially popular This Is Your Life show, whilst on a visit to Bernard Delfont, their friend and recent employer from England. 
To begin with, they look totally bewildered and very confused with what is going on as the cameras burst into Bernard Delphont's room at the Knickerbocker Hotel in Hollywood and they are told to get to the studios at once. Being a live show, Ralph Edwards, the host, had to add lib like mad as Stan and Ollie took their time getting to the studio. I thought I can go. They're here? Oh, thank goodness, because that was my last ad lib. Here they come now, our two principal subjects, Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy. I think I have been told. Oh, my. This is more than a two reeler. Here they come. Stan disliked appearing for free on anything. His financial complications worried him greatly because of his marital mayhem in the past. He was also concerned with not being in character, worrying that the public would not accept them as themselves. The usual cavalcade of past acquaintances were trotted out before they were reunited with their wives at the very end of the programme. Hal Roach Jr., who had by now taken over the running of Hal Roach Studios from his father, was present and had noticed how popular the boys were becoming again. He offered them a contract to make four 60-minute colour films for NBC to be shown during 1957 and 58. The series would go by the title Laurel and Hardy's Fabulous Fables, made up of many sketches and gags which Stan had never fully fleshed out for any of their movies, as well as some older music hall and pantomime routines which he'd rework. Stan, as ever, could never let go of a good joke, and many of their routines were often redone time and time again to try and create the perfect version. The whole series would have been a collection of fairy tales and, sadly, a fairy tale is all that it became. Before shooting began, Stan had a mild stroke, which put a final, the end, on their careers. He was told to take things at a slower pace. Oliver Hardy had always, because of his burgeoning size, taken life at a slower pace. However, with concerns over his heart, he decided to proceed with a crash diet that saw his weight shrink from over 20 stone to just over 10 stone. The effect this had on his appearance was shocking to anyone that knew him, but his body suffered the biggest shock and obviously couldn't deal with the sudden change of metabolism. In 1956, the very same year of his drastic diet, he suffered a stroke. A second, more serious one occurred not long afterwards, and he was effectively sent home from the hospital to die. In the last few months of his life, he couldn't speak or hardly move, and Stan spent every lucid moment by his bedside. You can imagine Stan in that tortured way of his, trying to explain something complicated, whilst Ollie just lay there looking exasperated and drumming his fingers on the mattress. Ollie twiddled his tie for the very last time on the 7th of August, 1957. Oliver Hardy was cremated and his ashes interned in the Garden of Hope, the Masonic section of North Hollywood's Valhalla Memorial Park. Stan Laurel expressed terrible shock at Ollie's death, saying that he'd been like a brother to him. The pair had never argued, and Stan's only wish was that his larger-than-life friend had realised how much people truly loved him. Stan and Ida Laurel moved to the Oceana Apartment Hotel in Santa Monica and lived in humble seclusion. Stan had always been a modest man and he was astounded by the amount of fan mail that poured through his door. He attempted to answer each letter personally and would spend all day at his desk in the study ignoring his health worries. 
He would take breaks if there was a Laurel and Hardy movie showing on the television and continually commented on what a funny fellow Ollie was. In 1961, Stan Laurel was awarded an honorary Oscar for creative pioneering in the field of cinema comedy. And it sat in pride of place on his Stan desk. Knowing Stan, he probably used it as a paperweight for all the fan letters. During his last few years of contentment, he received visits from many famous comedians of the day, all wanting to pay tribute to their unofficial teacher. Put that thing down! Danny Kay, Peter Sellers, Jerry Lewis and Dick Van Dyke would all regularly worship at the altar of England's Lancastrian son. Dick Van Dyke tells a tale of being desperate to meet his idol and couldn't find out from anyone in show business where he lived. He happened to flick through the telephone directory and Stan, like any other person, was listed. It amazed Dick Van Dyke that someone he held in such awe could be so down to earth and ordinary. In 1965, Stan suffered a heart attack and was confined to his bed. Stan informed the nurse looking after him that he'd rather be skiing. She, surprised, asked him if he skied. He, with characteristic wit, replied that he didn't, but he'd rather ski than die. Well, here's another nice mess you've gotten me into. He passed away a few minutes later, joking to the last. Ollie, is that really you? Of course like Ollie great. before him, Gee, Stan was it. cremated and his ashes were interned at the Court of Liberty Forest Lawn Cemetery. Both Stan and Ollie's graves are visited regularly by adoring fans and the few brief words on both their memorial plaques are very poignant indeed. Stan had lived just long enough to see the birth of a worldwide fan organisation for Laurel and Hardy of which he was made president and helped to set up the amusing guidelines. Sons of the Desert took its name from one of their classic films and Stan was proud that he and Ollie would be remembered. To this day, Stan and Ollie are as popular as ever. Memorabilia sells for high prices at auctions and two dedicated museums have been set up in their respective birthplaces of Ulverston, England and Harlem, Georgia, and they've even been commemorated on postage stamps. As this programme draws to its conclusion, we'll take a closer look at the two museums, which are doing such a fine job of preserving the memory of Laurel and Hardy's comic genius. Ulverston is a classic English market town and visitors will enjoy a sense of nostalgia here even in the 21st century. As we've already seen earlier in the film, Stan Laurel's birthplace in Argyle Street has a commemorative plaque, but herein lies a very interesting tale. The name of Bill Cubin is synonymous with the Laurel and Hardy Museum when this great Laurel and Hardy fan was mayor of Ulverston in the 1970s that Stan's birthplace was officially recognised. Bill then went on to found the museum from his own collection of Laurel and Hardy memorabilia and it grew at a rapid pace. As you look around the museum you can see that every bit of available space has been used and you do need to make sure that you take it all in. When Bill died, the museum was left in the capable hands of his daughter Marion, who, with the help of her sons, is carrying on his precious legacy, which is great news for Laurel and Hardy fans the whole world over. It's certainly been some time since Laurel and Hardy died, and the most popular films belong to a bygone era when cinema entertainment was a much more innocent business than it is today. However, there's still a timeless element to their movies and visitors to the museum are able to watch all their favourites in a miniature movie theatre which Bill Cubin created especially for the purpose. 
Grandparents remember seeing the comic duo at the cinema. Parents remember watching the films on television. And the children, who are lucky enough to be brought here, will enjoy Laurel and Hardy's slapstick antics with new eyes, creating extra special memories of their own. What the Ulverston Museum on the English side of the Atlantic does for Stan, the Harlem Museum does for Ollie on the other side of the pond. Harlem, Georgia was founded in 1870 and was named by a New Yorker visiting the town who thought it resembled that more famous Harlem of his birthplace. Sadly, you won't locate Oliver Hardy's birthplace because it was demolished in the late 1950s. But don't let that deter you as the wonderful Laurel and Hardy Museum of Harlem certainly makes up for it. This is a delightful work in progress where, just like its English counterpart, exhibits are expanding on a daily basis as memorabilia floods in from all over the world. Just as Bill Cubin created a truly atmospheric small cinema to screen Laurel and Hardy classics at Ulverston, the museum in Harlem has provided a movie theatre for its visitors too. Although the memorabilia is wonderful, and knowing the real men beneath the Derby hats is an added bonus. It's the movies that really show the magic of Laurel and Hardy, cutting across age and cultural barriers to bring pleasure to one and all. Laurel and Hardy are truly adored by people of all ages, from 8 to 80, and this is mainly because the love they put into their comedy really did shine through. Other famous comedians such as Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton were always proud to show their technical brilliance and expertise on the silver screen. The audience would laugh, but also be thinking how clever the performers were. And in doing this, the audience was kept at a distance. Yet Stan and Dobby, although just as technically and comically adept, would hide all that to just go for the laughs pure and simple. They were the true clowns, and that is why they are still laughed at and loved in equal measure today. In the end, true lasting fame is achieved not by luck, but by hard graft, talent and a touch of magic. Stan and Ollie put in the time and the effort to make their comedies little works of genius, and it's for these flickering black and white images that they will be best remembered. Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy were, are, and always will be a match made in heaven, who've left their comedy footprints forever on the face of this earth.